Father, in the name of Jesus, bless everyone that's hearing this program today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Lord bless you. My name is Pastor Harris Kekalides, and you're watching here in the program, Gain to Know Jesus. And today's study, we're going to study on the treasure hidden in a field. It's found in Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. It's very debatable on what is the treasure. Is it Christ? Is it the church? Is the treasure wisdom from God, our communication with God, our relationship with God? What is that um, treasure? Um, the reason I say it's very debatable because every commentary ha seems to have a different point of view. Um, there are some that agree, but many of them don't agree. Um, Hawker, um, poor man's commentary, he says, The treasure may most probably be Christ hid in the field of Scripture. Um, from the wise and the prudent, but revealed unto babes. I like that, but he may be wrong or he may be right. Um, Christ is definitely hid in, this, in, in the scripture. Um, he's everywhere in the scripture. In the Old Testament, he's hidden, but you can find him. He's, he's spoken about in prophecy. He's spoken about in types, shadows. So he may be right. Um, but what is that treasure? What is that field? Um, is he speaking about the field of scripture? Or is he speaking about the field of the world? Um, we read in Matthew thirteen thirty eight, the field is the world. So, at least this parable is not referring to the field of, of scripture. It's referring to the field of the world. Because Jesus' other parables that he said before that, he said the field was the world. Now, it was very common in those days for people to hide their treasures, um, their belongings in under the ground. Um, not much people <clears throat> depended on banks. There were some people that did not want to go put their money in the banks. I don't blame them. Uh, my dad... One time put his money in the bank and he got bankrupt and something went wrong with the computers. He lost everything. But then a year later, he goes again and puts the money in the bank. And he said, that's the most safest place. Um, I don't put my money in the bank. I just spend it. I don't put my money on the ground. I just spend it. Anyway, that's another, that's another topic. Now let's, let's talk about this parable. And we see that in the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven, um, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven could use, be used interchangeably. Um, sometimes Jesus said the kingdom of heaven, and then he, in Matthew, he also goes on and he says the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew 19, we see that, um, though that phrase used interchangeably. <clears throat> In Matthew 19, verse 23, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Surely I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 24 of Matthew 19, he says, And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is one and the same. There are some people who like to make a distinction between those two. No, it's the same thing. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Even now, <clears throat> when you talk <clears throat> to, to certain people, sometimes Jews, sometimes people who don't like to mention the name God, <clears throat> they will, instead of saying, thank God, they will say, thank heavens. They use heaven as a substitute for the word God because they feel that God's name is holy. They, the word God is a very holy word. And then people do that still and now. So, <clears throat> we read in Matthew thirteen forty four again the kingdom of heaven, 
or a kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in the field. We we see why people would hide their treasure in the field. They don't trust banks and and um they just could dig a dirt and hide it. But there was a rabbinic law back then that if you hide your treasure in the dirt and someone finds it, he he has all the rights to it. Well, but this man <coughs> we read that <coughs> he found this treasure hid and he was joyful about it. He found, let me read again, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. He found treasure hid in a field and he hides it again, he hides it again. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. Are you willing to leave everything behind for Christ? If Christ is that treasure, are you willing to leave everything behind for Christ? Or count everything else as of little worth compared to Christ? And if the church is that treasure, <clears throat> did Christ leave everything behind to be with his church? And the answer is, Christ did. But let's look at uh, what Paul says. <clears throat> Paul says, what things were gained to me. These I count loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them rubbish. The Greek says I count them dung. That I may gain Christ. <clears throat> That means Paul, um, he was a Pharisee, he counted that as dung. He was, um, he had one of the best teachers, Gamaliel, one of the most famous teachers. He says, that's dung, that's, that's trash compared to Christ. He was circumcised in eight day, a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin. And he said, all of that is rubbish. All of that was rubbish. Um, we go to 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 and it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus became poor so we can be rich in the things of God. It's amazing. <clears throat> when Jesus tells us, <clears throat> to forsake all to follow him. He's not telling us something that he has not done. <laughs> Jesus forsook all. And he is the perfect example of one who forsake us all. Are, are, are we willing to, to leave everything behind? To follow Jesus because Jesus left everything behind. To be with his church. We read in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. It says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Did Jesus forsake everything to be with his church? Did he forsake his father? Yes, <clears throat> though his father dwelt inside him. <clears throat> and he had a relationship with his father, yet Jesus shared with the glory with his father. John 17, verse 5. Jesus had the same glory with the father. They were sharing the glory together. They were being worshipped together in heaven. They were being adored. They, they, they were, uh, they, they, he was constantly with his father in heaven. And yet, he forsook his father to, to come to be with his bride those 33 years and a half. Jesus forsook all. Jesus saw a treasure in the church. Something that maybe we don't see. But Jesus saw us as a treasure. A treasure to be redeemed. He bought us. Um, he bought us with his blood. Um, don't ever think that you have a little worth. If you're a Christian. Jesus paid good money for you. He paid his blood for you. Now, let's go to Luke 14. 
and we read Luke 14 verse 26 <clears throat> if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, and his own life, he also cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> Does this refer to hating like I hate your guts? Or is it referring to counting it them as little worth? Counting your wife, your father, your mother, your husband, your children, your sisters, your brothers of little worth compared to Christ. And the answer is, is counting them as a little worth compared to Christ. Knowing that if <clears throat> they were a hindrance, if there, if there is a hindrance in them from you coming to Christ, if they take your time to you coming to Christ, if they don't want you serving Christ, and they say, well, you have to choose between Christ and us. Well, you're going to have to say, I choose Christ. Christ is all for me. And bye-bye, mother. Bye-bye, father. Bye-bye, wifey. I choose Christ. But they're not a hindrance to you from serving Christ. If they say, well, well, we don't have a problem with you serving Christ, even though they might be worldly, then that's not in reference to that. The Bible says don't leave your wife if she's not a believer. Who knows that you might get her saved or leave your husband. Who knows that you might bring them to Christ. It says it in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians um, 7, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 13 it says, And a woman or, who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by her by the husband otherwise your children will be unclean um, but if the unbeliever departs let him depart a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases but God has called us to peace for how do you know O wife whether you will save your husband or how do you know O husband whether you will save your wife we don't know so if you have a wife or a husband that's not believer Consider them as a field to win them to Christ. Because you never know, you might get them saved. Okay, now, what well, we are called, uh, we go in Luke, back to Luke. Luke 14, I was reading. Uh, verse 27 now. But compared to Christ, they are of little worth. Christ is, is everything for the Christian. Verse 27 says, And whoever does not bear his cross and comes after me cannot be my disciples. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first, count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. That's a, another parable. Lest after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who sees it, begins to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against them with 20,000 or else while the other is still a great way off he sends a degradation and asks for conditions of peace so likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Those are strong words. You mean that <clears throat> everything I own, I need to count it like it's worth nothing compared to my relationship with Jesus? Yes, everything you own. Count it as nothing compared to your relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus did it for you. <laughs> Even while on earth, the little bit he had, he counted as rubbish to be with his church. 
We read in Luke 8 verse 19. And then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told, this is Luke 8 verse 19 to 21. And it was told to him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to seek you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. <laughs> In other words, I don't worry about them. They are little worth compared to my church. <laughs> some people like to put Mary in high regards. Well, not in the eyes of Jesus. Jesus never put Mary in high regards. He put his church higher than Mary. So, so we're Jesus' treasure. We're the apple of his eyes. And Jesus is our treasure. He is the apple of our eyes. He is the treasure beyond all treasures. A treasure that we're willing to forsake all to be with Christ. Lord bless you and I'll see you in the next program of Gain to Know Jesus. Bye. If you found this program a blessing, make sure you share it with your friends and family. God bless you until we meet again. Unfailing love.